Hello and welcome to the Poor Hammer Podcast, episode 50. I'm your host, Brad. This is my co-host, Eric. How's it going? And we've got a fun one for you guys today. To celebrate 50 episodes of failure, we're going to talk about some several million year old failures, the Necrons. Wow, way to sell the Necrons. I can't sell them. I own too many. No one would buy them. <laughs> You're buried too deep. I'm buried in the tomb world of Necron models. <laughs> So without any further ado, let's jump into today's topic. Sounds good. So some good Necron news. They updated the FAQ for Ark of Omens. You can use the Silent King again. Yay! So before we get into things, I just want to say I'm sorry to people who wanted Chaos Space Marines to be the next sub-faction breakdown episode, but... Chaos Tax. Yeah, chaos tax. You have to wait an extra two years to everybody else. <laughs> More seriously, we didn't want to just spitball ideas. We wanted to let Ark of Omens settle for a bit so that we could look into CSM more because neither of us really play CSM. I played Thousand Suns, which is sort of, but not really. I don't. I've got nothing. Yeah, so instead of having to play the guessing game, we are going with something I know near and dear to my heart, the Necrons. Yeah, I mean, there's been some pretty serious changes in how Necrons have worked. Honestly, the past couple months have changed a lot, and then changed a lot again. So, should be interesting to hear your actual takes on these sub-factions now that there's been work on them, and they're not just an auto-take of one thing. Yeah, and we don't tend to talk about these sub-faction breakdowns in any competitive sense, other than just a nod to, like, this is by far the correct choice. But with Necrons, there was a special problem that we need to talk about right away. Previously, Necrons as a codex, as I've talked about on many past episodes, was held up by a sub-faction, basically using it as a crutch to make themselves playable. You had a custom dynasty where you could do Eternal Conquerors for a dynastic tradition. In shorthand, it's called Obsec All, but it's everything with this code has objective secured. If it already had objective secured, it counts as two models for Obsec. Right. And you were previously able to take that with a Circumstance of Awakening. Specifically, you always took Relentless Expansionist which was at the start of the first battle round before the first turn. Everything can make a normal move of up to six inches. Very rarely you would take something else, like Novak lists on occasion would show up, and meta-dependent. A couple different things would occur. It was always Eternal Conquerors, and then almost always it was Relentlessly Expansionist. You had to have the obsec all. So what happened is in the latest data slate, they took away Eternal Conquerors, the Obsec All dynasty. Technically, you can still take it. But you can't take the second part of it. Which makes it strictly worse than one of the main named dynasties, so they essentially took it away. Right. So, to me, this is good news. Oh, it's great news. So it is a nerf, unfortunately, and Necrons wasn't exactly top faction when we got nerfed. We're used to getting kicked, it's fine. But from a health of the codex standpoint, having an auto take always sucks. I mean, that's just how competitive usually ends up. Lists become more homogeneous and like, but previously the entire balance was warped around that combo. Now, without that, there can be some more balance, the point adjustments and stuff like that without it auto having obsec all and a six inch pregame move. Balancing around that with everything else was just like, you couldn't really do it. So it's technically a nerf, but like it opens up so many doors that we can actually talk about stuff now. And I do think there are other custom dynasties, like combos that are worth talking about. We're going to focus on the main name dynasties for this episode. But I may give a little nod of the hat to a couple of the custom dynasties that I tend to like. Okay. But let's finally get to talking about the many dynasties of Necrons. All right. So first, Eric, let's talk about the Silent King's dynasty, the big man himself. All right. Zerikin Uncanny Artificers. 
has the three abilities. Each time a model with this code would lose a wound as a result of a mortal wound, roll 1d6. On a 5-up, that wound is not lost. The second one is each time a unit with this code is selected to shoot or fight, you can re-roll one wound roll when making that unit's attack. And the last one is you can double up on Protocol of the Undying Legions. And Protocol of the Undying Legions, Directive 1 is each time... This unit uses its living metal ability. Each model in this unit regains one additional lost wound. And directive two is each time you make a reanimation protocol roll for this unit, you can reroll one of the dice. Serikin also has a warlord trait dedicated to it, which is the Triarch's Will, which has when you assign command protocols for the battle, you can select four instead of five. And one of those four can be assigned for two battle rounds instead of one. Then you've got a rather useless relic called the Sovereign Coronal. The first ability is an aura that doesn't do anything. The second ability is if you're being affected by one command protocol within nine inches of the bearer, you are affected by the non-active one as well. And there's the stratagem Empiric Damping, 1 CP. It's a war gear stratagem. Use a stratagem in your opponent's psychic phase. When an enemy psyker attempts to manifest a psychic power within 18 inches of, of a Zarakon unit from your army, roll 1d6 on a 4-up. That psychic power is denied. Okay, so you've said that this is the French vanilla sub-faction, whatever. What do you mean? So this has been a running theme in a bunch of the codices where there is a vanilla sub-faction, like a default paint scheme sub-faction type deal that has a very safe, pretty bog standard set of rules that are more than likely meant to be the rules for a newbie that are the help you not screw up. Okay, yeah. The don't feel so bad about this being complicated, it's okay. Yeah, and they tend to not be bad. It's just they tend to follow a formula. So let's open a random codex. Wow, I randomly chose Custodes because I'm going to make a point, kind of <laughs> sarcastically. Yeah. Emperor is chosen as the default in Custodes. It's what's on the tin. So in Zarakin Dynasty, we have a feel no pain of five up against mortals. Emperor is chosen, gets the same thing, but it's on a four up. Nice. And then we have each time a unit with this code is selected to shoot or fight, you can reroll a wound roll. When making that unit's attacks. Emperor's Chosen. Each time a unit with this trait is selected to shoot or fight, you can reroll one hit or one wound roll. So that's cool. I see what you're saying of like, you know, one bullet point thing to kind of deal with like mortal wounds. One to make it so that like it's easier to hit or do wounding on your attacks. And then some like generic other stuff. Yeah, and I believe Oryx has one that's exactly like this. I think that one's actually Death Skulls. I don't remember. It might be split over two of them. This shows up in Sisters. Technically, it's split in half, but both halves of these appear in Drukhari. You find these a lot as traits and sub-factions. They tend to be put somewhere safe as like a, hey, you can always fall back to this if things are going awkward, right? Yeah. It is actually nice to have that, like, default option of, like, here's a defensive ability, here's an offensive ability, and then some, like, thematic kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And Zerikin is not my cup of tea. It's cool. It's the Silent King's faction. There's nothing wrong with it. If you want to play him, play him very thematically. You can pick Zerikin Dynasty and just be happy. Yeah. I'm not going to pick it, but I'm not going to stop others from picking it. I will say it's kind of awkward the Relic is super dated because the Codex does not run on the rules the Relic was written with anymore. Yeah, just don't take the Relic. <laughs> now, that being said, Necron Relics. Famously amazing. We love Relics. Oh, yeah? It's probably <laughs> best you just save the CP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Triarch's Will, it's honestly solid as a Warlord trade. I'm not going to say it's like top tier or anything, but hey, it's cool. And it's always nice to have a 1 CP half the time you deny a Psychic. Yeah, so the Silent King should just have a little more anti-Psyker than he does, but if you're playing his sub-faction, you at least get a very nice homage to our Blackstone technology. To hype up playing them a little bit, yeah, I was just going to say, like, I mean, we've kind of gone through, like, the rules-y competitive part. Yeah. 
the Silent King is a cool model. I think that's fair. But like, why these rules with the Silent King? Like, what's the point here? So not taking damage from mortals and the whole helping to deny against psychic and all that. Technically Noctilith, which is Blackstone, which is the anti psyker stuff that Necron stuff is all made out of. Okay. Zerakin's dynasty is known for it. And Zerakin is the uncanny artificers as their whole naming scheme and all that. They're supposed to be like just absolutely armored in this stuff. Completely could wipe out chaos if everyone would get out of their way and they cared to do so. Uh, the rules don't quite do that, but I kind of get it. Like, it makes it so the living metal's better, reanimation protocols are better, you've got other defensive stuff in the mortal wounds, you hit better or wound better. Again, that just gets into the whole you've got the least decayed tech. Oh, okay, okay. You're the best upkept. <laughs> You're only ancient. You're not deadly ancient. We're barely a few million years in the crypt. (laughs) Oh, God. Nice. Okay. So you've got all that going for you. And I like Zarek. Like, he is a cool idea. He has not been in basically any lore, uh, which is a whole Brad rants about lore episode that I promise at some point I'm going to snap and do. (laughs) <laughs> should be interesting a silent king's model has been out for two years you still cannot read about the silent king seems like kind of a failure for the main character of a faction to not get any type of book or anything there's talking about the silent king in some of them and how he hasn't been seen in 60 million years yeah yeah There's the, you know, head nod to it. It's building up hype, Brad. Come on. Yeah, like they've been building up hype for Bellacor for 30 years to not write any lore for him. Oh, God. Yeah. In 40k, I'm aware he has a whole thing in AOS. Do not email us. Or do it anyways. That'll be funny. But, okay. So, I guess that kind of makes sense from like a lore spot of, you know, what this actually is all doing. I think the problem with these safe sub factions, just like when we did the Custody episode, I don't know what to tell you as like an army idea or why to play it other than like, this is just a nice, safe, vanilla learning spot. It just kind of works. Yeah. Start here. Figure out if you like it. If you don't, start trying the different flavors. But you can be a fan of vanilla ice cream. Is there any way of like really taking advantage of Protocol of the Undying Legions? Or is it just like reanimation is so bad no matter what because gw prices are like that that like don't try it from a casual standpoint i could definitely see you picking it as your all game one just because getting both halves of the ability is enough to make it so it's not bad okay i will say that it's hard to argue it over other protocols as your all game protocol even if you're only getting half of the other one and getting both halves of this we've talked about in the past but i guess it's going to be a main part of this episode So I should mention, protocols changed. They don't work the way it says in the codex. Read the data slate for how they function. Basically, you pick one to be active all game, and then your other ones are each active for a turn. You choose the order before the game starts and all that jazz. Then you flip one over at the beginning of each battle round, and that's what you've got for the battle round. You pick directive one or directive two. If you play a sub-faction that tells you that you get both when you're affected by either, cool, you get both. Right. And protocols are just, like, board-wide. They're not, like, that aura or whatever, essentially. Yeah. Which is why the Sovereign Coronal, whatever the hell that thing's called for Zarek, doesn't really do anything for the first part of the aura. (laughs) Right. It used to be real bad, and we had to be within auras of our characters to get any rules. Yeah. Gone are those awful, awful, awful days. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those that that whole change is good. It just works well. It's actually fairly clean. And Sarikan sounds neat. Like, I could see, maybe not competitively, just because of how GW point costs reanimation and stuff like that. But, like, it would be a fun list, in my opinion, to just be like, I'm going all in on living metal and reanimation protocol and just being annoying. (laughs) <laughs> to be fair, it's not terrible. And I could see you, like, really getting into it. You go 
Canoptic reanimators. You go Technomancer healing your vehicles up. Do a good mix of Silver Tide and your basic Doomsday Arc vehicle spam. Right. The mix of that and just playing defensively with it all and playing for gaining back more wounds, using Zeracon to help temper our giant weak point against mortals. And yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those that, like that list is not trying to kill stuff. It's not trying to make the opponent get, you know, tabled. It's just being annoying and like impossible to get rid of. And I, I, that seems super fun to me, but competitively, probably not. So. No. Uh, again, we're not too concerned about competitive. It's more about hyping up why you would pick each one. Right. I just have trouble with vanilla factions. They're not my jam. Right. That makes sense. Let's move on to the elephant in the room to get it out of the way. Let's talk about Nihilic Dynasty. All right. Nihilic, aggressively territorial, has units with this code have objective secured ability. If a model in such a unit already had this ability, that model counts as one additional model when determining control of an objective marker. Also has each time an attack with an armor penetration characteristic of minus one is allocated to a model with this code. If that model's unit is wholly within its controller's deployment zone, that attack has an armor penetration characteristic of zero instead. And you can double up on Protocol of the Eternal Guardian. Protocol of the Eternal Guardian, Directive 1, is each time an attack is made against this unit, if it did not make a normal move, advance, or fall back to this battle round, that unit receives the benefit of light cover. And Directive 2, each time an enemy unit declares a charge against this unit, if this unit is not within engagement range of any enemy units, it can either hold steady or set to defend. Then they've got the Infinity Mantle, which is like... The Infinity Gauntlet, but not quite as good. Nihilic model only. Add one to armor saving throws for the bearer. Each time the bearer would lose a wound, roll a d6. On a 6, it's not lost. Then they've got Precognitive Strike, which is a Warlord trait where at the start of your fight phase, if the Warlord is in engagement range of enemy units, it fights first. And Reclaim a Lost Empire for 1 CP. Use the stratagem in your shooting phase. Select one Nihilic infantry unit from your army that is currently performing an action. They can still shoot this phase without the action failing. So why is this the elephant in the room, Brad? Uh, you read it right away. It still has obsec all. So uh, they got rid of the custom dynasty, so you can't mix it with six inch pregame move anymore. Nihilic still exists, so you can still do obsec all and get all of Nihilic's other toys, which are not nearly as good as a six inch pregame move. That's the thing is like, yeah, Nihilic Obsec All is good. Like, Obsec All is just good. Mm -hmm. But it was necessary to take it kind of thing. Yeah. It's not necessary anymore. I still think that if you were just grinding out wins, Nihilic is probably still in the top two dynasties to play. Just because of the sheer average cases working out to your advantage. Just abusing Obsec All is just good enough. Yeah. Now that said, this dynasty is not nearly as boring as Eternal Conquerors. Nihilic Dynasty is famously Trazen's dynasty. Very fun dynasty lore-wise. There's a lot of reason you would want to be part of this dynasty. Trazen's fucking badass. Dude. You've read The Infinite and the <laughs> Divine, which is required reading. It is. We should talk about that at some point. Like, that book was awesome, and Trazen is so cool. <laughs> it's not as caustic feeling as playing like Eternal Conquerors and Relentless Expansionist was. It's still very good. It is nice to me that this feels like an actual sub-faction. Part of my complaint when Eternal Conquerors was the thing was you don't get anything out of it other than the trait. Right. You do not get a Warlord trait, a Relic, a Stratagem. It feels like you are playing... Your data sheets, but everything is obsec all. You could just delete the rest of the codex. Right. And that's kind of why I just don't really like custom stuff like that, because it just feels, I don't know, we'll probably talk about it. I just, I don't know, I don't like them. Custom dynasties and all of the other variants that have been released this edition have to walk a fine line. You don't want them to be the very best thing. Because of what I mentioned, it feels very bad to give up on all the fun. Right. To just take what is mathematically the best and is depressing. Exactly. 
it's why we haven't done a Necron episode yet, because it was really boring to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, there was basically no point. It was just like, here's your, I'm a special snowflake. I chose these ones because this is what I need to do to win. And there's no other options. So why are we talking about any other options? And shout out to our episode where we did my Necron list. I had been playing the Necron parking lot. Right. Typically, it was called Mefret Parking Lot. I did Obsec All pregame six inch move because, for all the cool things Mefret had to offer, none of it was on par with being able to control objectives and win the game. Right. It's just sad that that's where Necrons was. There have been buffs since then. It's nice that we're not as reliant on Obsec All. There's reason to take things like Novak, Mefret, maybe even Zarakin. But Nihilic still exists as your, I just want to play Obsec All still, and I'll play it no matter how bad it gets. If you need that crutch, Nihilic exists for you. That said, there's still fun things to do in Nihilic ignoring the Obsec All. First of all, it is good flavor for a Nihilic. It's all about being the British Museum. You're walking <laughs> onto their land, claiming it's yours, taking their shit, and going home. I mean, it really does, you know, your objective secured and, you know, you've got the reclaim a lost empire. Yeah, it's reclaim a lost empire. You are aggressively territorial as your subtitle. Everything about Nihilic is we are the rich dynasty and not through legal means. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah. The precognitive strike of like. I hit you first, and now I'm going to take all your shit, and by the time you get back your senses, I'm going to be gone. Nihilic has a decent amount of lore to it, specifically due to Trazen and Solomons and all of that. Yeah. It's probable that you have liked Nihilic, but had no reason to play it, because you could just play better Nihilic by playing custom dynasties. Right, right. Now you have a reason to play Nihilic instead. And, I mean, I do think that Precognitive Strike is an interesting, like, fight first is something that you can kind of be interested in. Yeah, so my main problem, this gets into a core Necron problem. You're going to say your characters. Yeah, (laughs) our fucking characters. And our rules for who can even be your warlord, unless this is an extra warlord trait, because you have to go down the chain of command. Right. Which honestly kind of works out in your favor, other than you can't give it to a Scorpec Lord or something. Because as you go down the chains of command, you find out Necron characters are worse than Admech characters who cost half the points. <laughs> and for some reason have one swing at strength four, while a Admech character, who's this tiny little 50 point model, has strength seven attacks and has like four attacks with it. And you're like... But I have the anti-matter staff, and it's a strength 4 weapon, and you have bonk stick, and it's a strength 7 weapon for some reason. Yeah. (laughs) While I like talking about the Necron sub-factions, external balance still is an issue. You do have cool things like the War Scythe, man. Uh, Don't get me started. That's like, what, minus 5 AP? You're not thinking of a War Scythe. The War Scythe is really bad. You're thinking of, like, the Blood Scythe, which is a relic for Novak. The Void Scythe in general. Those are the things you're thinking of. Okay, okay. Maybe we'll get to it. Okay. Yeah, then, yeah, Precognitive Strike sounds interesting, but probably can't build a list around that one. (laughs) I more am all here for you want Nihilic because of the lore. Trazen is, without a doubt, the best Necron character. He is probably... One of the top three most likely to be your favorite character in all of 40k characters. Dude, Oricon is crying in a corner right now. Yeah, Oricon has his own appeal, but it's not the same. (laughs) He's fun as a shitbag. Treason is like (laughs) everyone's favorite troll. (laughs) Yeah, fair enough. To me, Nihilic sells itself. The lore sells it, and it has rules good enough that you don't need to, like, sell someone on it. It's like, hey, you finally have an excuse to use that great Nihilic name. Use it. All right. That makes sense. There is Trazen's whole thing about getting a free relic usage. Pretty neat. I still don't think Trazen's rules are that great on the tabletop, but damn it, I'll force him anyway. Yeah. I don't remember him being particularly good, but (laughs) he's still cool. 
So I guess we can move on to Mephret since that's kind of what you've brought up. This is one of my two favorite core dynasties. It's Mephret and Novak, and it's not really close, and it's probably the case for a lot of people. All right, so Mephret, Solar Fury, the first bullet point is add three inches to the range characteristics of ranged weapons, excluding pistols that models with this code are equipped with. The second bullet is each time a model with this code makes a ranged attack that targets a unit within half range, the armor penetration characteristic of that attack is improved by one. And you can double up on Protocol of the Vengeful Stars. Protocol of the Vengeful Stars, Directive 1, is each time a model in this unit makes a ranged attack on an unmodified wound roll of 6, improve the armor penetration characteristic of that attack by 1. And Directive 2, each time a model in this unit makes a ranged attack that targets a unit within half range, that target does not receive benefits of cover to its saving throw against that attack. And then Mephret's got a Warlord trait, Relic, and Stratagem, as you would expect. The Warlord trait is very simple, Merciless Tyrant. Add one to the strength and attack characteristics of this Warlord. Conduit of the Stars is the Relic, which is a Mephret model only. Use this Relic to replace a Relic Goss Blaster. It has the following profile. Conduit of the Stars, 36 inch, Rapid Fire 3, 6 minus 2, 2. And then... Talent for Annihilation for 1 CP. Use the stratagem in your shooting phase when a Mephret unit from your army is selected to shoot until end of phase. Each time a model in that unit makes an attack, an unmodified wound roll of 6 inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. A maximum of 3 mortal wounds can be inflicted this way. Dude, you get shit on by the max of 3. <laughs> you can tell that Necrons was the first codex. Yeah. They stopped that shit real quick. <laughs> there is caps in the Necron Codex that are like, just let them have it. Where it's like, it is so statistically unlikely this did not need to be capped, just let them have it. Yeah. Well, I mean, like on the Grey Knights one, like we had the one where like... It wasn't capped. It wasn't capped, and it was like, that's a problem. But like, three as the cap? Yeah. <laughs> We were written first, and it's easy to tell. We're going to find that a lot as we go through here. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's talk about the bad with Mefford before we talk about the good, because there is a lot of good. Your relic doesn't exist. What even is this relic replaces a relic? What are we doing here? This is where it gets confusing. Why? That is the name of a weapon. Why is that a thing? The Necron Codex had a lot of care and attention put into it. Coincidentally, it came out at the same time as Mickey Mouse's Codex. God, that is just so stupid. <laughs> I mean, 36 on range, rapid fire 3, flat 2 damage. Okay, so, do you want to know who can use the Conduit of the Stars? Uh, sure. Of our many HQs? Of your, like, 15 HQs that are all trash? It's the Royal Warden. That's it? Yeah, the new guy who is just a slightly dolled up immortal. Cool. Yep, this is a locked to a specific sub-faction weapon replacement relic that replaces a weapon that only one bad character can take. Like, it's kind of cool. It's not like this, like holy shit, look at what it's doing kind of thing. You know, like, it's it's locked to this one character in this one sub-faction, so we can go a bit crazy. We can make it a rapid fire eight, strength eight. If this was just an Imperium army written in the middle of the edition, the Conduit of Stars profile would just be the generic gun that a character has. Right. Instead of the relic for a specific bad character. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is weird. That's kind of a miss on Mephret then. <laughs> so that's the worst thing out of the way. Talent for Annihilation is actually pretty decent. I know the max of three is just so disappointing because you can't live the dream. But realistically, three is fine. And you can double up with Malefic Arcing to do both in the same shooting phase, which can add up quite a few mortals in one shooting phase. Additionally, we have this trick more in our favor now with the CP changes from the last big iteration where now you get a CP on every player's turn. Right. So you get a lot more CP during the game that you have to 
burn through and Necron isn't a stratagem strong codex, so you might as well. <laughs> Fair enough. You do a lot of CP reroll when you're playing Necrons because uh, we've got some niche stratagems. Fair enough, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're not Novak. So, like, Talent for Annihilation is pretty good. Merciless Tyrant is kind of the, like, catch-22. It's in the wrong sub-faction. Yeah. You add a strength and an attack to a Warlord, which makes you want to play melee with this Warlord. Right. This is the shooting sub-faction. Everything's about, like, increase the range of your ranged weapons. When you're shooting with a ranged weapon, do stuff. Like... Yeah, that's the problem is Merciless Tyrant should have been like a generic warlord trait and had something else for Mephret's warlord trait. Yeah. It's a little weird. Now, the meat and potatoes here, for those who don't know much about Necrons, let's talk about Mephret for a minute. Nephric are the Necron equivalent of like Admech to the Imperium. Mephret are Bill Nye the Science Guy sub-faction. They have the biggest guns, the coolest toys. That's their shtick as a dynasty. Okay. Again, Seracon, because they are the king's dynasty, their thing is Blackstone, and having everything upkept because it's the king's dynasty. Mephret is the science dynasty. So they're just making newer, cooler stuff. They make the cool new gun. You can think of it like Custodes vs. Admech for Imperium players. Okay, yeah. So, some people try to merge those together and wonder why there's two of them. That's the difference. Yeah, I can see that making sense through, like, the rules here. It makes sense on, you've got cooler weapons. <laughs> yeah, so if you have, like, a planet-destroying cannon that the Necrons whip out, it's probably Mephret. That folds well into why you want to play them, which is they're just the shooting sub-faction. Do you want to play a gun line? Do you want a reason to play all that Tesla that's really bad? This makes it good. Yeah, there's a decent amount of armor penetration stuff going on here. Yes, there is. And mortal wounds in addition. Right. So the thing Tesla's got going for it is a lot of hits. Adding armor penetration and mortal wounds is pretty damn good. I can see that being pretty good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Mefford is the first of the dynasties that we're talking about where I believe it's correct to just take Protocol of the Vengeful Stars all game if you're in Mefford. You're building your list around shooting. Protocol of Vengeful Stars gives you more AP when you roll sixes, and it means you can ignore light cover when you're doing your Mefford minus one AP in half range. And your range extends, thus making it a longer range in both cases. And because it's range focused, it's not one of those where it's like, oh, you need a defensive to close ranks. Yeah. Kind of thing. So it's like you can just stay back and shoot. And Mephret gained a bunch of ground by Armor of Contempt going away again. Yeah. Specifically because we had AP zero weapons, Tesla is what you wanted. Right. So when you moved it to AP one, AOC moved it back to AP zero. So why the hell are you playing Mephret? <laughs> Good job, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Mephret is in its heyday right now. If you want to play our Necron parking lot list I talked about that I was experimenting with, go play it with Mephret. It would be fun as hell. It will be a very cool, fun game. It will be actually pretty good, so you don't have to worry about just randomly sucking. <laughs> there is actual excuse to play Mephret instead of just playing Obsec All now, so you have a reason to play the fun version. I am all for it. I don't think this needs that much more explaining because, like, most people who are into Necrons want to try out Tesla lists and stuff. That's what Mephret's here for. Especially now, like you said, with AOC going away. Yeah. Like, have your fun kind of thing. Like, really enjoy it while you can. Just to walk you through this again, if you've got some Immortals or whatever, Annihilation Barge, which is a terrible vehicle... You've got something with Tesla, you're firing out a big old pile of Tesla shots, like 10 plus Tesla shots, a bunch explode, you've got some plus one to hits, maybe you've got a Lord for reroll ones, who knows what you're doing. You're doing a bunch of hits, a bunch of them explode, you're in half range, when you roll sixes to wound, you get an extra AP. You get an extra AP just by being in half range. 
they don't get light cover, which is huge because most 40K boards have a lot of light cover in them. That's kind of how buildings work. It's also one of those, like, if you're up against a shooting army, don't stand out in the open, idiot. Use light cover. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And you get to ignore that when you're doing this. Right. You've got all that going for you in addition to just having some bonus range, which is a nice little thing in your favor. And then you've got Malevolent Arcing. You've got Talent for Annihilation. Those are proccing a bunch of mortals around, especially against castle armies. Good lord, with Malevolent Arcing. That stacks up real quick. Maybe you throw a Katan in there for some more mortal wounds if you want to go that route. I actually have a really fun mortal wound spam list I like where you run a bunch of bad plasmancers and you run a bunch of Katans, but that's a different story. Could be played in Mephrit. So Mephrit in general just kind of screams, play a Tesla shooting army. It's super fun. I like it. I like it a lot. So we'll move into what is probably my favorite sub-faction and kind of has been for the named sub-factions for the entire edition because they murdered my old favorite. (laughs) All right. Novak. Awakened by murder. The first bullet point is add one to charge rolls made for units with this code. The second one is each time a model with this code makes a melee attack, if that model's unit made a charge move, was charged, or performed a heroic intervention this turn, improve the AP characteristic of that attack by one. And you can double up on Protocol of the Hungry Void. Protocol of the Hungry Void, Directive 1, is each time a model in this unit makes a melee attack, on an unmodified wound roll of six, improve the armor penetration characteristic of the attack by one. And direct to each time a model in this unit makes a melee attack, if this unit made a charge move, was charged, or performed a heroic intervention, this turn add one to the attack's strength characteristic. They also have a relic, warlord trait, and stratagem. To start things off, the relic is the blood scythe. Novak model replaces a void scythe or war scythe. It has the following profile. The blood scythe is melee, strength plus two, AP minus four, damage two. Each time the bearer fights, it makes two additional attacks with this weapon. Then you've got Blood-Fueled Fury, which is their Warlord trait. Every time the Warlord makes a melee attack, an unmodified wound of six inflicts a mortal in addition to any normal damage. Then you have the famous Blood Rite Stratagem, which is use the stratagem in the fight phase when a Novak unit from your army is selected to fight. Until end of phase, add one to the attack's characteristic of models in that unit. I feel like Mephrit was shooting i think i know what novak's trying to do (laughs) that's right (laughs) novak is very subtle it is as subtle as a brick to the face yeah it's very subtle with that blood scythe and the blood fueled fury and the blood rites and awakened by murder i wonder what it's trying to do so fun fact novak paints themselves red (laughs) which is symbolically the blood of their foes their blood angels equivalent (laughs) world leaders equivalent their very subtle melee (laughs) sub-faction the red sub-faction is the melee one unless you're orcs then it's the fast one yeah (laughs) okay is there like an actual reason for them being melee or is it just Novak is the most brutal, warish, like, the bad guy, Necrons. They're just out there to murder everybody. Get off our land. Also, the entire galaxy is our land. Was that because they hate being Necrontier? Or is it just like they've always been assholes? They were assholes as Necrontier. Now, granted, all Necrontier dynasties hate each other. Like, Okay. Any human society. Necrons are like the post-human staple of like, wow, it's just like (laughs) us for real, for real. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's probably good for the rest of people that Necrons aren't united. They were united specifically through the command protocols, through the Silent King, all that jazz. And then then Zarek did his, bye, I'm leaving in guilt. And we never saw him again. Uh, until he, his model is back and he doesn't have any lore. So, <laughs> Novak does have some like minor flaws. I know it's like pretty straightforward. Hey, do you want to play melee, kids? Play Novak. You won't be disappointed. Yeah, it feels a lot like that. <laughs> Protocol of the Hungry Void, all game. Don't even think about it. Just push the button. Novak is like legit 
my favorite current iteration of the sub factions from like a rule standpoint. I mean, lore wise, it's just they're the brutish idiots who like causing war. Like <laughs> they like violence. Yeah. <laughs> now, gameplay wise, they're a really fun way if you want to play like score packs and wraiths and all of the fun parts of Necrons I love that's not silver tied old skeleton boys. If you're here for like the destroyer goodness, this is where you're going. Are you trying to say that you can't play a bunch of flayed ones? Yeah, flayed ones for sure. Absolutely. Now that said, the blood scythe. The blood scythe. Let's talk about the blood scythe for a moment. Okay. It's kind of weird and it's sort of a side grade. Really? That's the problem with it. Okay, so it can replace a war scythe, which is the only thing it's got going for it. Because war scythes are cheaper than void scythes. Okay. But you're paying a CP. But, I mean, you're Necron. There is also the Void Reaper, which anyone can take. The Void Reaper is a generic relic that Necrons can take and don't. Replaces a War Scythe or Void Scythe. Melee, Strength plus 2. Okay. AP minus 4. Okay. Damage 3. Oh no. (laughs) And instead of getting plus 2 attacks, it has, each time an attack is made with this weapon... Rules that ignore wounds cannot be used. Oh. Which also works on DR now, because reasons. Don't ask why. I was just going to, I'd like, that doesn't make any sense, but sure. That was the new FAQ that came out with AOO. I guess I missed that one, but that doesn't make any sense at all, but okay. I'm not having that discussion today. Some other time. So, okay, I mean, the blood scythe sounds so cool, though. Yep, but the Void Reaper kind of feels better than it, right? It does. It actually does. And it's just a generic one that you don't have to be Novak for. Yeah. I mean, okay, to be fair, having more attacks when you're already, like, buffing the amount of attacks and stuff that you're trying to do with blood rights. You're not using blood rights on your character. You're using blood rights on ten flayed ones. Probably. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Or six score packs, like, realistically, Novak, Lich Guard, Sword and Board can fuck. Those things are great. I just want the Blood Scythe to be cool. It sounds so cool, dude. Yeah, and here's the other problem. Like, the Void Scythe isn't even bad to begin with. Like, so look at the Blood Scythe again. Blood Scythe is plus two, right? Yeah. Void Scythe is times two. Wow. Minus four. Okay. Three flat damage. Okay. But it has subtract one from the hit roll because it's like a power fist. Okay, okay, okay. So it has a downside with it, it does, instead of yeah. plusing attacks, but it, it hits harder still. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. The Blood Scythe is weird, man. Like everything else in Novak, mm, magnifique. But the Blood Scythe, uh And Bloodfield Fury is kind of wrong to take if you're playing a melee centric character because kind of bait we don't get 100 attacks on characters we get like six fully decked out so having your warlord trait be like statistically you get about a mortal wound when you do all your attacks is not worth it right yeah i mean there's some like generic ones would be better for that which is funny because our generic ones aren't considered very good in the grand scheme of things yeah i mean it's selling the story and i'm okay with that it is it's just you're here for the idiot proof traits you have and the amazing stratagem yeah because you can double that up with the lich guard plus one attacks and when they're within x of your warlord i can't remember the exact distance and you can do like all sorts of stuff i forget all the tricks but essentially like on charge lich guard and novak can get like seven attacks per lich guard nice you can destroy stuff while still using the shield and sword version instead of going full scythes. That's pretty cool. I love no fuck, man. Like, <laughs> I like Lich Guard. Lich Guard are very cool. I like everything to do with destroyers. Now, granted, shooty destroyers are really good in Mephret, too, which, again, Mephret's my other favorite. And then I love flayed ones other than the fuck the price on that official sculpt. Make your own. They're very easy to kit bash on your own. I did mine. You can do it. I promise. It is. I love everything that you play. No, I love wraiths, just canoptic stuff in general, which tends to be very melee oriented. 
Yeah, I was going to say, like, you just really do like the Canoptic side. I really have a fetish for Canoptic stuff if I ever show off my Necrons. Like, that's my shtick. And then I really like Destroyers now, too. Because, like, I started right at the end of 8th. The ninth edition trailer was coming out when we were, like, debating getting into 40k. I was wishy-washy on what to pick. That score pack destroyer came out, swinging that giant just cleaver. Oh, yeah. And I was like, K is Necrons. <laughs> <laughs> Sold. And so I started collecting, like, my wraiths and all that, and my billion little scarabs I have. I love the canoptic part of the army. Destroyers came out. I got a hold of the old destroyers, and boy, howdy, does that kit need an update. It's ironic, like, as a Necron player, the only part of Necrons I don't like is the one that every boomer played Necrons for, which is Silver Tide. Silver Tide, hell yeah, boy. I can appreciate Silver Tide. I can play it as, like, a refresher. Silver Tide's back. Like, Ark of Omens, Silver Tide, Chef Kiss. Sure, but, like, I can appreciate it. I can understand wanting to play, like, one to two monoliths one to two hqs and just a shitload of warriors yeah i get it it's not my thing but i get it and i can play it like you know once in a while freshen the palette up and then go back to what i like but to me that's not my part of the army which again is probably why i have trouble selling certain sub factions i think that that is part of it yeah but yeah i mean novak is really cool so and it's clean i gotta give it that like you know what you're doing yeah and like Novak is what I based my custom dynasty off of when we did our crusade back then. Right. Which I'll get into at the end because I want to talk very shortly about some custom dynasty stuff because I did an obsec all. Because you're a special snowflake. I am. Let's keep going into Sautek, the old default dynasty that has been usurped this edition. Okay, Sautek. Relentless Advance. The first bullet is each time a morale test is taken for a unit with this code, you can re-roll that test. The second one is instead of following the normal rules for rapid fire weapons, models with this code shooting rapid fire weapons make double the number of attacks if the shooting model's target is within 18 inches. And you can double up on Protocol of the Conquering Tyrant. Protocol of the Conquering Tyrants Directive 1 adds 3 inches to the range of this unit's aura abilities to a maximum of 12 and increase the range of the following abilities this unit has by 3 inches to a maximum of 12. These are the Lord's Will, My Will Be Done, and Rights of Reanimation. Directive 2 is this unit is eligible to shoot in a turn in which it fell back, but if it does, then until the end of turn, each time a model in this unit makes a ranged attack, subtract 1 from the attack's hit roll. All right, Sautek also has the things they all have. Starting things off, we've got Hyperlogical Strategist for a Warlord trait. While this Warlord is on the battlefield, each time you spend a command point to use a stratagem, you can roll a d6. On a 5-up, that command point is refunded. Then you have Vanquisher's Mask, Sautek model only. At the start of your fight phase, you can select one enemy unit within three inches of the bearer. That unit is not eligible to fight this phase, until all eligible units from your army have done so. And then, Methodical Destruction for 2 CP is Sautek Stratagem. Use this stratagem in your shooting phase after a Sautek unit from your army has finished making its attacks. Select one enemy unit that was targeted by an attack made by a model in that unit this phase. Until the end of the phase, each time an attack is made by a model in another friendly Sautek unit against that enemy unit, add one to that attack's hit roll. Good lord, is that written like crap. Yeah, it is. Okay, so what is Sautek? This is Silver Necrons. This is silver and black with green lightning. This is what you saw for 25 plus years for Necrons. <laughs> okay. This is who they are. If we want to get Space Marini and start talking about color schemes. Okay. That's who the Sautek were. They got sidelined. Zark is back. Zark and Dynasty is vanilla ice cream again. Move over, Sautek. You're dead to us, is what they writ with these rules. You're dead to us. Conquering Tyrant's not great. Combining that with really bad static abilities. Just real bad. Each time a morale test is taken... This is Necrons. We have leadership 10. Yeah? And it's a reroll. <laughs> it's like... 
you couldn't just make it like don't even bother <laughs> should just say morale's test just just stop <laughs> and then you've got your rapid fire weapons have 18 inch instead of half range for their double attack count if you want that mefford gives you plus three inches which is plus 1.5 inches to your half range anyway and comes with all the shooting bonuses so you're not playing this as a shooting sub faction however when you get rid of the very subpar static abilities yeah huh? Sautek has a pretty good generic warlord trait that, again, a lot of armies have this as one of their generic ones or a generic relic. This one is locked to Sautek. Vanilla factions get them a lot, and this is a leftover of they've always had this. It's boring, but it's efficient. The Vanquisher's Mask is, like, the sexy thing here. I do like Fight Last. Like, it should never be underestimated. Dude, it's powerful. There is some kind of fun stuff you can do in casual lists with this. And like you use like a melee unit in front of a character with this three inch range kind of sucks. It does. Yeah. But it's a very cool relic. It's unfortunate that it's so short range. So you can't put it on like a support character very easily. And the Vanquisher's mask can't get like buffed, right? So like the three inches, because it's not like an aura, it's not like, a, it's just like a, this is written out within three inches, that's it. There's no altering to be had here. Yeah. Because I was thinking, I was like, well, yeah, three inches is pretty bad, but like, if you're in the Conquering Tyrant, your aura abilities, but okay, no, never mind. <laughs> yeah. And then Methodical Destruction is very strong. It's two CP, but we all know how good plus one to hit for anything shooting a unit is. If you need something dead, this is the make that thing dead for 2 CP. The way it's worded is stupid, but yeah, it is like the choose this thing, everything gets one to the attack roll against it. Like, kill it, (laughs) 2 CP. Oh, it's terribly worded. It hurts my brain to read that out loud. Yeah. Now, I know I haven't done a good job of selling this yet, but I've not told you the selling point. Sautech has a long history of being the Necron dynasty. And I mean that as, like, sub-factions didn't exist in Necrons yet because their lore sucked so much that they just had so little. Okay. I mean, that's not a selling point in and of itself, but... You know I have a hundred named HQs, right? Yeah. They're all (laughs) Sautek. Okay. (laughs) the ones The ones that aren't are, like, Trazen... Arankir, who's the traveler, his shtick is not being one. Zarek isn't either, but he's obviously Zarekin. But there's like seven or eight named characters in this dynasty, including Imhotek, who to a lot of people is the OG leader of the Necrons. Like, if you're an old school player, that's who you think of as leader of the Necrons. Like, lore-wise right now, if you were to read the Necron Codex for the like one paragraph of lore they give us, yeah. Imhotek is currently trying to usurp Zarek, who exists entirely within the Necron Codex. Because Imhotek, again, currently Sautek is still top dynasty in the galaxy. They are like the most awake and active. So Sautek is kind of like the big dog still, and Imhotek believes he should just take over a Silent King. So because of all that, your characters are why you're in Sautek. Like, do you want to play the characters? Do you want to play your older Orokin, Imhotek, Zandrek, Oberon? Like, that's what we're doing if we're playing Sautek, is we're playing it to play named character spam. It's kind of like when you play named character Tau Sept and Tau. So this is tough because I see what you're saying. That is a good reason. It, it honestly is. Like, if you just want to play the named characters and stuff like that, and you want to be thematic and you want to have that, but then I look at all of these characters' data sheets. The data sheets isn't what's going to upset you, Eric. Lord of the Storm is actually pretty cool, so is Grand Strategist. Like, Imhotek's got a pretty cool data sheet. The problem is most of them are fine cast. <laughs> oh, yeah, the models themselves <laughs> are... Like, you were like, dude, Imhotek's, like, the thing. And I was like, isn't that, like, really old, shitty model? Yeah. <laughs> You could just stop at, it's a Necron-named character. They're all fine cast garbage. It's tough, because, like, when I think of, like, cool models, I'm always like, dude, the Void Dragon is so cool. So it's like, I associate Necrons 
with like kind of cool models and then like i'm just smacked with a fish when i looked at look at these <laughs> character models I was like smacked what? with a fish hey, that's what it feels like man like how did we go from void dragon to like this this is what <laughs> this doesn't mesh man this doesn't mesh welcome to playing xenos eric <laughs> fair enough we don't get those Imperium updates every five minutes. Yeah, yeah. They're finally catching us up in ninth edition, and the Space Marine players are bitching that it's been a year since they had 16 models released. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, Sautek is interesting from that aspect. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of like the rules interactions going on there, but that stratagem is going to be powerful. So, I get it. Yeah. Let's end on a quick low point to talk about my old favorite, Nefric Dynasty. All right, Nefric Dynasty's translocation beams. So they have models with this code have a six up invulnerable save. They have each time a unit with this code advances, it can translocate. If it does, do not make an advance roll for it. Instead, until the end of the phase, add six on just to the move characteristic of models in that unit. If a unit translocates, until the end of turn, models in that unit cannot shoot. Each time a unit with this code falls back or translocates, until the end of the phase, models in that unit can move across models and terrain as though they were not there. And you can double up on Protocol of the Sudden Storm. Protocol of the Sudden Storm, Directive 1, add 1 inch to the move characteristic of models in this unit. Directive 2, if this unit is performing an action, it can still make attacks with ranged weapons without that action failing. They also have Skin of Living Gold as a Warlord trait. Each time an attack is made against this Warlord, subtract 1 from that attack's hit roll. They have the Translocation crypt stratagem for one cp use the stratagem before the battle when declaring reserves and transports select a nephric unit excluding vehicle or monster from your army it gains dimensional translocation which is deep strike and they have the solar staff which replace a staff of light the solar staff has a shooting of 24 inches assault six five minus two one with an ability of each time an attack is made with this weapon against infantry unit, if a hit is scored, then until end of turn, that unit is blinded. Blinded units cannot overwatch or set to defend. And a melee profile of user minus two one. With an ability of each time an attack is made with this weapon against an infantry unit, if a hit is scored, then until the end of turn, that unit is blinded. Blinded units cannot overwatch or set to defend. Yes, the melee profile has that. Dude, you're just blinded by the light. So, Nefric, I'm so sorry. So, for those who don't know, it was slightly different last edition, which made it a lot better. I used to let a 6-up invuln. I'm like 99% sure it's been a while. They were my first love because they were the advance and charge sub-faction. So, it's just kind of sad we lost our fast sub-faction that most armies have, and we got the, like, fast but at what cost sub-faction. <laughs> You can be really fast. You just can't do anything. I think it's still interesting enough because, like, it's just one of those, like, if you're able to be fast and you're focusing on, like, actions for, like, actually winning the game, getting victory points and stuff like that. But anyone can take protocol of the sudden storm on turn one or two, which is what everyone does. Yeah. There's just only so much you can do action-wise. Like, the game is not pure actions. It's something that you do in specific cases that you build your list to compensate for having them. Right. And it's not a big deal to do that. It is one of those, like, it's nice to have that. But like you said, when you need it, you can still take Protocol of Sun and Storm and other factions. Like, Yeah. You can still take advantage of that. And you can't warp a list completely around actions. Like, it's just not... <laughs> How the game is set up currently. The stratagem sounded really, really cool. Till AOO. That made it a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Huzzah, I can pay a CP to give something deep strike. So the Warlord trait is like, good. I actually like the Warlord trait. Minus one to hit for your Warlord's a fine defensive trait. Shame is locked to this sub-faction, because you're never going to take it. Yeah. Then we get to Solar Staff. What are you doing? I don't know, man. 
Solar Staff is like such an adorable, we had to write something and just didn't know what we were doing with the edition yet, so we shipped this thing out. In the melee profile, it still has the blind effect, which can only occur this turn, but this takes place after charge, which is the only time the blind has an effect. It's got the sweet, sweet profile of strength user, <laughs> which gets back into the whole Necrons are strength four. If this was just a random AdMech data sheet, I'm pretty sure their 50 point characters unnamed random stick has strength plus three and they have two more natural attacks than us. I don't hate the fact that like the melee is whatever if the shooting was like really showing it off kind of thing you know like it's one of those where it's like we're here the solar staff is to upgrade the white staff into a shooting thing like that's why we're here but it's like 24 inch assault six strength five minus two one what well and to make things worse you've played against me enough times you know when i say i have the voltaic staff (laughs) fuck that thing dude (laughs) the voltaic staff replaces a staff of light and is a generic relic yeah. Now it's got less range, but let's be honest, you're putting it on your command barge because it's the only thing that we have access to that is going to be worth putting it on. Because <laughs> you're not putting it on a crypt deck with one attack. No. But the Voltaic Staff has Assault 4 instead of Assault 6. It's got Strength 6 instead of Strength 5. Same AP. Which does actually matter. That extra strength does matter. It does. Same AP. It does 2 damage instead of 1. Mm-hmm. And it has Tesla. Yep. That Tesla part's annoying as fuck. (laughs) It often feels like the Assault 6 anyway. It's just a better weapon. In melee, it's strictly better as well. The ability is cute, you know, where it's like thematically, oh, that's funny. They're being blinded, but it doesn't really do anything. No, I'm not (laughs) going to try to sell someone on Nefric. I would like to sell GW for a moment if they're listening. You have a wonderful double book series of Rain and Ruin that showed off an awakening, dying off dynasty with troubles. Stuff I don't want to get into because it's spoilers and those books are very good. We lack something for like destroyer heavy, flare heavy, really focus on wanting to play those. Uh, we've got Novak, which is just general melee fest, right? But, like, specifically, I want to play the corrupted horror portion of Necrons. Yeah. Let's make the trade here. (laughs) So, what is the history behind Nefric? Uh, It has very little. Okay. And it's a little muddled. It's one of the awkward ones where it's got that feeling of we needed six. So, we just kind of, like, gave it some real quick flavor and just called it good. So, my Nefric lore is a little rusty. I remember it from long ago. They are the best at having cryptex who can do chronomancy, I believe. They can see the future. And they've also got... They are rich like Nihilic, but not as rich as Nihilic. Nihilic's got the rich part, so it doesn't matter. Like, whatever. And the big thing is they're like the sacred holders of technology. I know what you're thinking, but Mephrix the scientist. Right. But, like, Nefric's thing is in one story, they guard a device that they refuse to use because they can see the future and see how bad things get if you start using it. That is an atomic bomb metaphor in Cold War. That is, like, you push a button on the screen, you, like, click a star, and the star disappears and doesn't exist anymore. You could just poof, souls doesn't happen, there is no sun, Terra is dead, goodbye. Wow. That exists in a random room, and they just don't use it because the consequences. They've got that whole stupid elf thing going on where all powerful in action thing. Sometimes lore, man. It just, like, you tell me on some great stuff every once in a while, and I'm like, yeah, I want to know more. And then you tell me shit like this, and it's just like, thanks, Grim Derp. Yep, that's why I'm like, Nefric. I loved your advance and charge stick. It's time to give you up. (laughs) (laughs) We can make the advance and charge stick the crazy flayed ones going at it. Like, we we can warp this into a good sub-faction. 
that has a different name and a good background that people want to read up on. Yeah, because, like, I mean, I would be interested in learning more about, like, the, like, corrupted part of Necron. It's fantastic. Rain and Ruin, good books. It's just kind of interesting to me of, like, the, you know, their processors are degrading and, like, then there's the insanity portions and, like, it's just kind of cool. The Dysphorak. Lots of fun stuff in Necron lore. Highly recommend reading Infinite and Divine. Yes. Highly recommend reading Twice Dead King, both books. Infinite and Divine is better, but Infinite and Divine is the best written 40k book. So we're still talking about a pretty good book here. <laughs> Honestly, at some point we should probably do a talk on Infinite and Divine because like, it's just a good book. Like, Step back from Warhammer and it's like it's actually written well. It has a good story. So we should do that at some point. But I would do any of... Rob Rath's books, like Assassin Orm Kingmaker, his new one, was hella good. And, like, I have no care about the factions that were involved in that. Yeah. But I do after reading it. It's that good of a book. So, like, I'll be reading anything he makes from now on. But, yeah, so... So that's our six. So that wraps up the major name dynasties. To real quick go through them again. Zerikin, Vanilla Ice Cream, Solid, Not My Jam. Nihilic, Trazen's Dynasty, also obsec for everything, so like you're gonna want to play it in a lot of games. Mefrit, classic shooting subfaction. Novak, every melee subfaction you've ever read. It knows what's doing. And then you've got Sautek kind of sitting on the sideline, and Nefric just wow. <laughs> yeah, they're in the timeout corners. So we have custom dynasties, and I'm not going to read all of these. There are a lot of them. Good. Thank you. I hate custom stuff like that. So <laughs> Eric's very anti-custom dynasties. I'm kind of, I like them. I like the just build your guys. Like, I hate when Space Marine players get picked on of like, ew, those Space Marines are blue. Why are you playing them as Iron Hands? Go fuck yourself. Like, Okay, so I hate this stuff like this this custom stuff outside of crusade like give me the core rules and stuff like that and then in crusade that you're trying to build a theme go custom have fun yeah you don't want custom to be the best thing because it comes at the problem you have no bonuses like there's no other knobs other than the traits right yep you can't choose to give certain customs certain relics or certain warlord traits or certain strats or certain psychics or anything like that. Because of that, it is literally column A, column B, or a couple that might be all-consuming like in Drukari, stuff like that. And it's just, it's going to devolve into pick the best thing in column A, pick the best thing in column B, like what happened with Necrons. Or if you're Drukari, it might be pick that all-consuming that is super broken. <laughs> How did you like liquefiers, Eric? Oh, that's great stuff. I had a Marty modeled and everything. And then that book <laughs> dropped and it was over, baby. Yeah. Okay, so back to these custom dynasties. What do you want to bring up on the custom dynasty stuff? So ignoring internal conquerors, the dynastic traditions outside of that have only a couple things that like really deserve a mention in my opinion i am a huge fan of rad wreathed okay that's kind of what i was thinking you're going towards yeah so rad wreath eric knows my custom crusade dynasty but uh rad wreath is units with this code have the following ability rad wreathed aura while enemy units excluding vehicle units are within one inch of this unit subtract one from the toughness characteristic of models in the enemy unit this is an aura it gets extended by things that extend auras you can technically lower their toughness at range. It's a close range, but at range. Which is not something that really happens. No, Death Guard can do it, but that's about it. Yeah. That makes Rad Wreath a very cool trait to give a Necron army. It is. You've got a couple others that are like little hat tip of like maybe you go with them. Butchers is plus one to charge rolls if you wanted to play melee but didn't want to play Novak. Yeah, that's neat. Unyielding is the six up invuln from Neferic. Meh. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> There's some other ones, but I'm not a fan of them. 
Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Superior Artisans is the half of Zeracon where it's the re-roll a wound. Oh, okay, okay. You have a couple options that aren't Eternal Conquerors, and you can see how much better Obsec All is than anything I just mentioned. Yeah. I mean, okay, so like, yeah, I'm with you. Red Wreath is neat, and it seems like the kind of thing that like you can play around with. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> And then, like, on the other side of things, in our campaign, I played as made-up custom dynasty. I'm cringing thinking of telling you all this, so I'm not going to get too much into detail. I wrote paragraphs after every campaign battle we did and everything, so, like... Yeah, you had, like, histories, and yeah, it was great. I did this, baby. I did Crusade. You fanfictioned it. I did. It worked well, too. Yeah. It was fun writing, like, trying to write losses as if they are victories anyway <laughs> to, like, really drive home the, like, Necron pompous nature of, like... Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter that we were driven off. We did what I wanted anyway. Right. So, anyway, I played it as a rival to the Novak dynasty who was defeated, obviously, and was, like, down to nothingness, who gets awoken by some ad mech expedition on like their last crown world and so they have to escape i actually lost my first battle which i wasn't sure what to do with my lore yet and i was like oh this is perfect i'll make the loss be we lost our world we have like two ships left and like a pair of Catan shards one on each ship and that's what we got to work with and we're gonna try to steal an empire back <laughs> We're going to take over a tomb world. I forget what I had in game one. It might have been like, I think I just did Novak, but I like instantly just erased it. I was like, no, no, no. Relentlessly expansionist, which is the pregame six inch move. Rad wreathed. And we're playing this as like the defeated rival to Novak. Just got completely stomped on. We're starting out with nothing. And it ends up like kind of a lot like the start of Twice Dead King. And I was like, sweet. I really liked the beginning of Twice Dead King for certain things. Fair enough. Yeah, so I am a big fan of Rad Wreath. I really like playing it off as alternative way like to play a melee, corrupted, destroyer-heavy, very little left to you type army. And Relentlessly Expansionist is just still really good, but there are other options. Interplanetary Invaders, if you're a vehicle faction, is pretty good. Like, 6-inch pregame move doesn't mean as much for vehicles, because you're probably parking your arcs in the back line anyway. You don't want them closer. <laughs> Yeah. And, like, your other vehicles already moved 12-inch fly, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> like, Interplanetary Invaders is really good for that. The Ancient Stir can be fun for a Canoptic army. Math-wise versus Relentlessly Expansionist is technically not as good, but ignore that because this is more flavorful. And it is interesting that there's a call out to Canoptic because that is an interesting part of the army. I mean, you've kind of pushed it enough. If you read the Necron Codex, anything outside of Silver Tide is very rarely written in the Codex. Yeah, right. Which is disappointing because, like, hopefully 10th edition, they'll kind of flesh some of these things out. Honestly, I look forward to seeing more Canoptic. I think you can feel throughout 9th edition... The flailing, oh shit, change course, <laughs> adjust course, as they didn't yes. realize just when they were writing stuff before 9th edition launched for this launch codex, how much people were going to want the new score packs to be the thing. Flares are going to be the thing. This yeah. is actually working. People want to play this. Oh my God, we didn't write it that way. <laughs> So I think in 10th, yeah. we'll hopefully see a bit more variety in, you've got your canoptic focus parts, you've got your destroyer focus parts, you've got your classic silver tide focus parts, and then you can see like this nice trio army, like the thing that happened with orcs recently with your nice trio that, uh, not all equal, but you know. It, it's honestly just like having those as options and them not being just, like, paper thin. You, like you said, you get one page. Come on, man. Like, we can do better yeah. than that. We can have, <laughs> like, themes going on here. We can have reasons going on here. 
So, like, as much as I'm not a huge fan of the custom dynasty stuff, that's a point in its favor of, like, you can make the custom dynasties for your canoptic Faustus, like. Yeah, and you go hyper-specific. Yeah. You could have, like, this one is for wraiths. This one is for Ophidian destroyers and wraiths. (laughs) The other one is for Scorpec destroyers and Ophidian destroyers. So now you can pick two that both do Ophidian destroyers, and then you know to accent with the other two pieces. You can make them powerful on the game designer end, knowing that it can't be abused in awkward ways because it's limited to these specific portions of the army, so you can control that. Right. A point adjustment on one of those three suddenly wildly nerfs this army. Like... Yeah, it's really nice because it lets people play very flashy things that are in control. And dude, I'm a huge fan of things that are flashy, especially when they're not just overpowered. I thought you were going to do a flash gets joke. I was going there, (laughs) but I figured I would not dilute the uh, Necrons with more orc. All right. We've rambled a bit. We discussed all of the sub factions and why you may want to play them in necrons except for nephric if you disagree explain to me sell me on nephric because i can't (laughs) but if you have a favorite combo also tell us that because i do like the custom dynasties and would argue against eric for them having good use don't forget to take a look at the necron parking lot episode goes into a little bit more detail on what's actually going on with how that layout works so yes and that about does it so let's get out of here sounds good 